I'm a puppet on a string. Tracy Island, time traveling, diamond could have she caught eggs. The comes to find you. Welcome to the Biggest Troll Sports Podcast with your host, Pia Bartholomew and Alex Reeves. In my mind, when she's not right there beside me, I go crazy because here is where I want to be. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Big and Tall Sports Podcast. Here on October 26th, we are recording this on a, what's it, Tuesday, Wednesday? Today's Wednesday. Wednesday, October 26th. How's everyone doing? I'm Pete Apostolopoulos with my trusty sidekick, Alec Reed. Alec, sidekick. how are we doing? Oh. Sidekick. That's the shoe fits. That's ruthless. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, we're here. This is our first episode, episode number one. Uh, we're going to do a little thing on the podcast that you'll catch in on uh, every once in a while, or every week, I should say. Uh, we're going to be naming our podcast after some of uh, the sports world's biggest stars based off our numbers. So, number one, who do we got today, Alec? We got the wizard, Ozzy Smith. Ground ball, Alice had the second for one, the double play. What a double play, play. by Ozzy Smith. Shot. Diving play by Ozzy. Long throw, you wouldn't believe it. Smith, corks one into right down the line. It may go. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. It's a home run, and the Cardinals have won the game. Absolute legend of baseball. Shortstop, 13 NL Gold Glove Awards in 13 consecutive seasons. 15-time All-Star. Batted 262 in his career. When he left the league, he recorded 8,375 career assists, which is an MLB record, as well as he held the record for double plays by a shortstop, which has since been broken. Uh, also has an NL record 2,511 career games at his position. Ozzie Smith, huge deal. If you're a baseball fan, and we're talking baseball today, Alex, so hopefully we get some baseball fans listening. We got I'm a baseball great- fan, too. I got my Blue Jays Troy Tulowitzki jersey on today. A little bitter today. Yeah, uh, you know, but- it's all right. We, we got, we'll talk a little bit about the World Series, uh, what went on in the playoffs so far. Obviously, we're starting right here, and uh, we played game one last night, game two's tonight, and we're hoping to post this uh, Thursday or Friday, so... You guys will hopefully be able to listen to this before the weekend games and uh, yeah, everything we, have- we say is not going to be is, is going to be before game two. So if everything we say gets thrown out the window in game two, I apologize. Kick some ass last night. So. Oh my god! It was- we'll get into that. We'll get into that. We're also going to be talking uh, with a close friend of mine who's now playing in the minor leagues for the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, catcher Owen Spiewak is going to come in studio and join us for the second half of the pod. So basically, Alec and I uh, were first-year students at Ryerson starting this out. Uh, Both of us have university experience prior. Uh, I went to school in the States and played baseball at Park University in Kansas City, Missouri. And Alec was at Guelph for three years. So we both have a bit of an unorthodox path to how we got here, but... Here we are in uh, sport media. It's starting its first years all over again, and we're trying to make a podcast, and hopefully uh, you guys like it. So uh, for you guys tuning in, you're probably sitting here going, first off, how did I get here? Uh, second, hi, Mom. Um, third, uh, if, uh, if, you're, if you're wondering why you should keep listening, uh, you know, Pete and I are, are a couple of first-year students, but it's not like we're not uh, – we're, we're pretty well experienced as far as this is concerned. Um, my dad, uh, Dave Reed, played 18 years in the NHL and passed his knowledge on to me. I went on. I played three years at the University of Guelph playing football. Uh, I was a quarterback, switched to tight end, receiver. I'm now currently coaching with the Griffins. Uh, I got a big game this weekend against McMaster in the first round of the playoffs. Just made our way into the playoffs, but uh, you know, ask how, right? So, Yeah, so we pretty much know what we're talking about here. Yeah, so. <laughs> unless we're talking basketball. Yeah, basketball. We'll get to that. We'll get we'll, to basketball. We'll get some good we'll, guests. We'll bring, in, yeah, we'll bring in some good experts when we try to talk basketball. Okay, so we're talking about baseball today. We have a minor leaguer coming in. And basically, when we talk about certain topics on the show, we're going to want to start out talking about some general stuff, and then we'll get into an eventual pinpoint uh, topic. I hard-hitting guess. topic. Yeah, we got one hard-hitting topic each each episode. We'll get into that in a second. But, I mean, we're talking baseball. What's going on in baseball right now, Pete? 
So uh, if you're listening uh, later on this week, it's Tuesday, It's Wednesday, so Tuesday night last night, uh, the Cubs and the Cleveland Indians played Game 1 of the World Series. Roberto Perez, who I'd never heard of Hope. before yesterday, Hope. even after a Hope. full series playing against the Toronto Blue Jays, Hope. yeah, hit two massive home runs off uh, the Cubs and... The Cubs looked pretty flat last night. I don't know if you watched the game. Yeah, yeah, I did watch the game. But, like, here, you know, I'm looking at my notes here, and I'm saying, like, I almost got to throw everything out the window. I mean, you got, you know, I look at the line. The Cubs were 190 bucks to win 100. Uh, Indians bet 100 to win 170. Now, huge, huge favorites, uh, the Cubs. 190 to win 100. 190 wow. to win 100. They're that big Huge favorites. favorites. And I think, you know, looking at this, uh, I think game two tonight – it's still a must win for Cleveland. I think the Cubs win this game, and I don't know if it makes it back to Cleveland. I think if the Cubs find their hitting stride, uh, which we saw them do against the Dodgers, and they rock Clayton Kershaw, I mean, I, I don't see them, you know, especially the pitching matchup. Do you, do you think Kluber can outpitch Lester again? Because, I mean, he did last night. He killed him last night. They had some very, very good at bats against Andrew Miller yesterday. And I think that if that, you know, David Ross said I was watching the post game and he was talking about. If you're going to take positives out of it, uh, they scored a run, or they almost scored a couple runs off Andrew Miller. There. And they took Andrew Miller to two hard innings. Like, yeah, you think you I, can do that he's, again? He's probably not going to be able to pitch tonight, and then he'll have the day off, and they'll go back to Chicago on Friday. But I mean, Francona's pretty set in his formula, right? I mean, he, 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 again, another big thing tonight is uh, uh, who's, uh, who's a pitcher tonight for the Indians? Uh, uh, Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer, tonight. yeah. I mean, another big thing with him is. He hasn't pitched in how long? And his pinky, right? You know, he, he went he hasn't thrown, two-thirds of an inning against he hasn't the Jays. Thrown and he hasn't thrown since the Boston series. No, no, because of a drone. Got to love it. Because of a drone. Now, so, 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 Pete, let's just start. Um, you know, you want to start we, with the Cubs and the Indians? No, I, I think let's just, teams? yeah, let's just, let's just go. Who do you like? You know, I think we go, we, we sit here and we talk. I think both of us kind of in agreement here. We tend to agree on a lot of things. Uh, Cubs are the favorite. After game, you know, before game one, I had the Cubs in five. After game one, I still kind of got the Cubs in five. I agree. <laughs> I, I just think it comes down to this. Look, the Chicago Cubs are built off young, their young players. You know, everyone talks about, look, Jason Hayward, $184 million or whatever he got, he's sitting on the bench, right? He had a terrible year. He's sitting on the bench. They're relying on their young guys to come through, and they have so far. Look at Javi Baez has been the player of the of the playoffs right now, playing defense, hitting a, hitting a bunch of extra base hits, and he's kind of been their spark plug. He had a great at-bat against Miller last night. You add Kyle Schwarber back into the mix, which was huge. He hit a missile yesterday that I thought was a home run, but you know if that ball gets up another five feet, that changes the complexity of the game, and it's 2-1, right? So... I think that the Cubs' young power guys, you know, the Rizzo's, Bryant, who's probably going to win the MVP this year, uh, Schwarber, Wilson Contreras, the catcher, Baez, those type of guys, you know, Cleveland has a very, very good mix of guys, but I don't think they have that young powerhouse team. You know, the Cubs can change the game in a pretty, pretty quick uh, swing of the bat. Yeah, and so I think aside from... If you look at Cleveland, they got Napoli who and Jose Ramirez, who had a great game yesterday after hitting 300 in the regular season and not really doing much in the Boston and Toronto series. So I think if you match up lineup to lineup, it's tough to pick well, against let, the Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it right now. I got I got it pulled up here. Uh, I just, I'm just going to roll through, and I, I'll give you the matchup, and and uh, and you tell me what you think. Like I'll give you my opinion after, but I'll, tell me what you think. You can't count so, David Ross. Well, we'll start off just catcher in general. I think this was... The biggest advantage for the Cubs coming in, obviously, Roberto Perez hit two home runs last night. But do do who has the advantage at catcher? Okay, so a lot of people don't know who Roberto Perez is. So let me just read this. So Roberto so, Perez this year coming into the playoffs had two bombs, right? Uh, three, three. Well, if you're counting the playoffs, he's got three home runs, batting one eighty three, one eighty three, on base percent, on base percentage two eighty five. Which, by the way, his on base percentage. Worse than Chris Bryant and Anthony Rizzo's batting average. They both batted 292. And he is 285. But he had two dingers last night. If you he look, hit two though, dingers last night. If you look, though, 
that guy is so good at setting up behind the plate. But Ross is, you know, how are you going to pick against David Ross? That guy's been catching for 15 years exactly. in the bigs. And Contreras, the young guy they have, is a stud, too. Absolutely. And he could swing the bat. But if you look behind the plate, the way that the Indians pitch with their bullpen, and obviously they had Corey Kluber going yesterday, but for the most part, they're hoping their starter gets five innings and they could just roll out Shaw, Otera, Miller, Miller. And, and Cody Allen. And so they have their kind of four horse guys down there who led the who led professional baseball. Those four guys led Major League Baseball in okay. ERA. So, yeah, so let's go let's go then to Cause if you we, we go back to so you know, we go from behind the mound, let's go out in front. Who you got so we go back to pitchers, right? Uh, this season, uh, in the postseason, the Indians have a 1.77 ERA. Okay? Um, in the regular season, the Cubs, first in the NL, 3.15 ERA. As a staff or just the bullpen? Uh, as a staff. As a staff, the Cubs are 3.15. He got uh, Lester obviously got rocked. I still like him pitching twice. If it has to go six, uh, you three got times, Three times Th- maybe. Three times maybe. But, I mean... Then you look at like at a guy like Arietta pitching twice if it has to go that far, yeah. right? Uh, and Kyle Hendricks too. You know, you the, the only thing that Cub, the only thing that the, that the Cubs don't have that the Indians have is Andrew Miller right now, and right? Aroldis, and they have Aroldis Chapman. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we haven't got to see him yet. The but thing, the I thing, think, who, who do you, like? I think starting pitcher wise, this isn't even a question. Who has the advantage? Not even. It's close. not even close. You know, Corey Kluber pitched well and has the ability. I mean, he's a Cy Young winner. He's got the ability to out pitch a guy like. Uh, like John Lester, but th- that, I mean, you can't match the Indians bullpen. I had a buddy. Stride for stride. I had a buddy text me last night asking me if I thought Corey Kluber was the best starting pitcher in the American League. And it's really tough to argue that. I mean, the guy won the Cy Young last year. He had an an up and down start, went on the DL and came back and was an absolute stud down the, down the uh, end of the season. And a lot of people were kind of pissed that he went to the all-star game but i think he's showing now that you know maybe it was pretty warranted i mean this guy again won the cy young right like you don't win that by accident and if you watched the way that he attacked the strike zone yesterday and the way he mixed speeds you know a lot of these young guys don't forget too, haven't oh, he's seen fearless him. too he's fearless exactly and they haven't seen him right and if you look at lester they they're both very very similar styles where they get they both rack up the strikeouts and they normally don't walk a lot of guys. Lester obviously had some control issues early on yesterday in that first and second inning, but he kind of settled down. Um, but if you look at the way he's not throwing at 97 miles an hour, he's going in there throwing 93, topping out, and he's just moving the ball. And Lester's kind of the same way from the left side. And if you look at the way their numbers stacked up going into that game yesterday, uh, Lester had a few more innings pitched and their ERAs were pretty much identical and they've given up two runs each going into yesterday. Obviously Lester's given up a few more now, but you know, Lester was two walks and 14 strikeouts and Kluber was seven walks and 20 Ks. And if you look and take out that, that's 20 Ks over 18 innings. Yeah, exactly. And if you take out that first uh, two innings against Toronto in the game that he started where he walked all sorts of guys and had all sorts of issues and the Jays couldn't capitalize on him. You know, that, again, changes but, but that's that it, series, too. But that's too. it right there, though, is the Jays couldn't capitalize on it. It's the same thing we, we talked about with Andrew Miller before, you know, uh, talking about how he loaded the bases. And as the Cubs, you're like, oh, man, we can get to Andrew Miller. Yeah, but you didn't. And you, and the Jays didn't get to Corey Kluber, and they didn't get to Andrew Miller when they had the chance. Z- zero out, bases loaded, and you don't get anything. Well, that goes to... Look at the approach, and I again, same friend we were talking last night during the game. Look at the approach that the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Cubs both take. You know, Chicago might have a more star studded lineup, but if you look at a team that's built to play like a team, that's the Cleveland Indians. Platoon guys all over the diamond. Every single guy is going to get in, going to get into at least one game. And their approach is to score runs and be winning by the sixth inning. It's like the Royals last year. Right. If you shorten, they can shorten that game, unlike the Cubs can, because the Cubs have a few good arms last night. But you saw Rondon got lit up last night. But I think with the Cubs, right? You look at the Dodgers series. At some point, uh, I mean, they're bound to explode. You know, they're bound to explode. It was the same thing in the. You know, you're looking at uh, at the Cubs and you're looking at the Giants series too, right? Down and out, down and out, down and out, 
and they're still here because they can just explode at any minute. And they have uh, what everyone talked about with the Jays is just that power from from all the way through. Um, but I think, you know, you look through this, and we'll wrap up fire this, right, because I want to get to a couple other things here. Um, first base, give me, who you know, Anthony Rizzo versus Mike Napoli. Anthony Rizzo is probably my favorite player in Major League Baseball. Okay. And so, I, the other thing is, too, really quick, again, going back to the approach, how many guys in professional baseball do you see, and we'll ask Owen this when he comes in, too, do you see choke up with two strikes every single at-bat? Anthony nobody. Rizzo does it, and he stands right on top of the plate and just shoots the ball with two strikes. And, and it's incredible. he knows what to do. So let's go second base, and I, I already know your answer because he's probably your your MVP of the playoffs right now. Uh, Baez or Kipnis? I love Jason Kipnis. Did you see his ankle? He no. sprained his ankle in yeah. the celebration. He has a grade two sprain. I saw a picture of it on Twitter yesterday. It was terrible. So, but Baez, regardless, I love Jason Kipnis. He's a great second baseman. But the way Javi Baez has played, the, how can you this, pick against that? Guy? This might be the only uh, real clear cut winner for the Indians here. You go shortstop. You got Lindor and Russell. Even I'm obviously you have to take Lindor. That guy's I mean, nuts. Got, Switch hitter hits three oh one. Batted three oh one. Aston Russell drove in ninety five runs. Yeah, right? but it, but he I mean, hasn't he but hasn't he been there. Well, he hasn't been there in the playoffs either. No, but again, that's another guy. He can go up there and get you that big extra base hit if you need it. He proved all year. He hit in the five hole all year. He's hitting eighth in the playoffs now because you have Schwarber back and you have Javi Baez emerging. So, but the guy can hit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I think this is the the. The heavy hitter matchup here. We got Chris Bryant and Jose Ramirez. Again, just like Kipnis, I love I love Jose Ramirez. Had him on my fantasy team this year. Loved him. Uh, but Chris Bryant's the MVP. How can Absolutely. You, you can't. And he plays Absolutely. defense, and he's a big dude, and he's, yeah. you know, he just does all the right things. The only thing with Bryant is that he has, I think, 14 or 15 strikeouts in the playoffs. So the strikeout numbers are a little high, but he's also has the most extra base hits, I believe. And he's got like eight or nine RBIs. Yeah. And, it's Eight just, or nine it's games. Disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. So he's doing his thing. Uh, Zobrist or Crisp? Coco quick. Crisp, again, killed the Toronto Blue Jays. He's a, a career, I think he's over 300 for his career in the playoffs. But Ben Zobrist, switch hitter, plays every single position. Again, how do you pick against that yeah, guy? You can't. And he hit a huge double yesterday. So again, you got to go with Zobrist. You got to go with the Cubs. Uh, Dexter Fowler, Tyler Naquin. Tyler Naquin is a rookie. I don't know if a lot of people know who he is or not, but the guy can play. He hit. I, he two, hit two ninety six, yeah, two ninety, uh, fourteen or like homers, uh, on base percentage three seventy two, four fifteen slugging percentage. And he started against the lefty last night. Did it. he start against the lefty last night or did Davis start? Uh, that's a good question. I can look that look up. that up. But Dexter Fowler, uh, for all the stuff that went on before the season started with his contract, and you know he. Didn't take the qualifying offer, then ended up signing a one-year deal anyways with the Cubs. I think that if that guy's not there, it's a completely different lineup. Because if you look, I believe, uh, I heard a stat the other day that they're 65-3, and three, somewhere in that territory. If Dexter Fowler gets on base twice, they win the game. So they they started at Rajay Davis playing center. Yeah, they went so that's Brandon that platoon. Geyer. Brandon Geyer in left over Coco. Brandon Geyer and, kills lefties. And Lonnie Chisenhall was in right, obviously. But that's what we were talking about, right? That Cleveland team plays the matchup so well. It's the same thing as their bullpen. The way they can match up in the bullpen, they can do the same thing. They have such a deep bench. And that's something that when you look at the Cubs, these are the two most complete teams, right? You know, the Cubs might have the star power and might have the advantage, but the way that Cleveland can play matchups, that's why they're going to be right there the whole series. And I think a lot of people, including myself going into the Toronto series, didn't really give Cleveland that much credit, but I think Terry Francona and the boys deserve it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so you mentioned Toronto, and I, I, I want to, you know, I want to briefly touch on this. I'm wearing my Blue Jays jersey. Uh, I love my Blue Jays. I was at game, uh, it was game four that they won. But it, this Blue Jays team is going to be different next year. And I think we have to accept that fact. This Blue Jay team is not going to be the same team. And, you know, uh, they gave the qualifying offers out to, to Bautista and, and Encarnacion. Are either of them staying? Realistically, are either of them staying? No. No. There's no question. You can't. Because, you know what? Ba- Bautista, Somebody, I... you, you can't even, like, you, you can't even contemplate keep, keeping Bautista right now. He's not worth the money that he's asking for. Edwin might be worth the money that he's asking for, but he's going to take more somewhere else. 
You're, you're going to tell me that if Boston calls and says, hey, whatever the Jays are giving you, we can give you more, that he's not going to go run and take that money. And that's not to say that he's a disrespectful person. Most guys are going to do that in the same position anyways. Exactly. And go and play in the biggest baseball market in the, in the league, other than maybe New York. Well, you can guarantee that somebody will give Jose 20 a year oh, for absolutely. three or four well, years. He's making, what, 15 right now? Well, if you look at the free agents too, who else is there? You know, Cespedes can opt out, but other than Cespedes – the Edwin only, and Jose, the there's not really much out there. Josh Mark, Mark Reddick. Trumbo. Mark Trumbo. Mark Trumbo. Mark Trumbo is probably going to re-sign exactly. to Baltimore. But he's the, he's the only other one. Uh, you know, I can pull up. Just give me a sec. I'll pull up the top ten here. But, I mean, you know, when you, when you talk about the Blue Jays, another guy, uh, Michael Saunders, going to be a free agent this year. I think you have to re-sign him. You're going to lose the rest of the. You're going to lose the rest of your team. He's your DH. But, again, if you look at Saunders – he plays only against, you know, he can't hit lefties very well. And you saw when he changed his, and again, this is the whole Blue Jays team. The reason why they did not beat the Cleveland Indians is because they did not change their approach. We've talked about approach with the two best teams that are in the World Series right now who deserve to be in the World Series right now. The Toronto Blue Jays did not change their approach. How many times did we see Martin or Batista or... Even Edwin a couple of times. The only guy that was going up there and having consistent, consistent, strong at-bats was Josh Donaldson because he was using the whole field. He was playing hurt. You could tell he was hurt, that hip or whatever's going on. The guy played almost every game this year. And I think that it was very evident that from the beginning of the series, from those first couple of games in Cleveland, if you have to score on Corey Kluber in those first two games. It innings, doesn't happen. You have second and happen, you have second and third one out and you have guys hitting pop ups to the catcher both times. So really quick because I want to talk about the Dodgers too. Um, so we got here are your top ten free agents right now. Steven Strasburg, Jays don't need him. Oh, this is next year, dude. That's what I'm saying. We got twenty twenty seventeen, right? Are we going twenty sixteen? Is Strasburg a free agent? We got Steven Strasburg, Carlos Gomez. Ioannis Cespedes. Yeah, this is, sorry, my bad. Jose I, I Bautista. Strasburg was the year after. Edwin Encarnacion. Josh Reddick. Andrew Kashner. Kenley Jansen. Adrian Beltre. Araldis Chapman. Those are your top 10. Okay, so according you, to that's according to MLBTradeRumors.com. But I mean, I that's think... That's a... MLB Trade Rumors is pretty good. And I think most people are going to agree with that. I mean, I, you know, Steven Strasburg is absolutely the number one free agent right now. Yeah, but... The, but Jays won't, the Jays don't need him. The Jays can't afford him. No, they don't need him. I've said to a couple different people that if I'm the Toronto Blue Jays, I take my starting rotation and I pencil them in on my whiteboard where they have all the names. If anyone's seen Moneyball, you've seen the big depth chart in Billy Bean's office. I put my five guys there, Sanchez, Stroman, Estrada, Hap, and Liriano, and I don't touch them. I just put those five guys up there and say, no matter what happens, we have the best starting rotation in the American they do. League. They do. They had the best Maybe AL. baseball. They had the best AL in the uh, sorry, the best ERA in the AL this year. Now, the right, other so real, thing, real quick, real quick, B, I just want to okay because yeah. uh, we got to move on. We got a lot more serious stuff to talk about coming up, uh, especially our my my next the next session, which will be my favorite. We'll get to that in a second. Um, the Dodgers, you know, everyone talks about how Clayton Kershaw until he wins it is going to be the Peyton Manning of baseball. Do you agree with that? Those people are idiots. Now, uh, see, yeah, I Clayton I, I, here's, Kershaw. Here's, I wanted to pull this up. Here is here is stats, and I don't know if you got it here. Don't read his ERA because his I'm ERA gonna, no, I'm doesn't not, I'm attest not read his ERA. to how good he pitched. This is all. This is all I'm going to say. How well he pitched. This is all I'm going to say. He pitched October seventh and did five innings. October eleventh, four days later, six and two thirds. October thirteenth, that's two days later, he pitches two thirds of an inning, gets a save to close the game in then, game five. Three days later, three days rest, he goes seven innings. And then on four days rest, he gives another five. And then that one. So this is after. So he goes five days. He pitches three games. And that third game, he goes seven innings, gives up two hits, zero in runs, six Ks. And you're going to tell me that he choked. That game that he pitched against the Cubs, they just got him. He, he did the last, well, that's the it. last game, the game six, he just, but you also have to remember the guy missed three months almost because he was hurt. So, I mean, and then to come back and to pitch that many days in those many, it's not only the amount of days, but it's how many, how many stressful pitches has he thrown? Right. Well, like a lot else, of people it, talk about, a lot of people are talking about Andrew Miller, but 
Andrew Miller is making it look so easy. He's, there's nobody on base. So he's coming in and he's just mowing guys down and he's just slinging. And that's why, you know, he's going out there and he's throwing 40 pitches, 50 pitches a night. And he's just cruising because nobody's getting on base. There's no stress to his pitches. And if you look at Kershaw, you know, there's not, there wasn't, the Dodgers bullpen was an absolute dumpster fire after being so good during the season. You know, guys like Pedro Baez blew up. And I think a few times even, Dave, Dave Roberts kind of overmanaged in a couple of situations. But you know what? That guy, for the team that they had, at the beginning of the season, if you told me that the Dodgers were going to go to game six against the Cubs in the NLCS, I would have told you you were crazy. No way. So I love every, everything we're talking about, and, and I do want to keep talking about it. But um, I guess I got to be the one who's got who's to relay it into the next segment here. Um, and this is absolutely my favorite part. And this was born in the greatest scenario <laughs> you've ever heard. We're sitting in class as a Tuesday, right? Yesterday morning. I'm sitting in class. Pete was not in class. And our prof starts chirping him about how he's not here and how all of a sudden the class is quieter. So he tells Pete here to live tweet his morning and the hashtag. Just so people know, there's like 20 people in the class. There's, yeah, there's like 20 people in the and class. And the week there's, before, we had a discussion about how. You can tell when certain people aren't there. Like and, me and Pete. Yeah. When we are not here, you can tell. So anyways, the hashtag, hashtag Pete's Tweets is born. So we're going to cue the music up. Cue the music up here. Pete, I want you to go through. And, and do you want me to read them? You want, you want to read them? You can read them. All right. I'm going to read. These are just a few of my favorites. This so, happened, by the way, because I was sleeping and my phone fell underneath the table and I didn't hear my alarm. You know, you know what my old man always said? You know what excuses are for? Losers. <laughs> excuses are for losers. Okay. That's true. So we're going to so start up. No, no, so it starts up. Woke up in the morning. Did not really feel like P. Diddy. Hashtag Pete Tweets. The Kesha song. The constant sink battle of which side is used for dishes and which side is used for thawing needs to be sorted out. Our, Hashtag Pete Tweets. Our apartment was a mess. And we, I had some nice chicken that I was going to make last night, and it was just a disaster deciding that disaster deciding which side of the sink to use because it was so gross. This one's probably my favorite here. Why is the pizza cutter dirty? I'm 99% sure we didn't have pizza yesterday. We got <laughs> to the bottom of that. Streets. We got to the bottom of that the night before on Monday night. One of my roommates made cookies, those Pillsbury cookies. Yeah. And... He made he put a little too much dough, so it covered a lot of the tray, and he used the pizza cutter to cut them because we don't have silverware. Uh, we just use plastic cutlery, <laughs> so he didn't want to use the plastic knife. So that so I that, got to the bottom. So of that. that leads into the next one. He tweets out breakfast poll hashtag Pete's tweets, uh, and and asks for a vote: honeycomb, honey Cheerios, toast, or the leftover cookies that were on the stove. Sixty three percent said leftover cookies on the stove. Pete, I gotta ask. You were really quick to jump off the pole, and you went with the honeycomb anyways. What is that all about? I didn't want to eat the cookies, and somebody, they weren't there when I got back from class, so somebody did end up eating them. I mean, but 63% is pretty, it's pretty overwhelming. Well, I didn't want to give time for the pole to ferment. I just kind of went for it and said, you know what, I'm hungry, I don't really care. And there was no honeycomb in the box, so... It was a, it was a, it was a bit of a disaster, but we persevered. So this ends uh, as, as Pete threw out his morning, goes outside, gets on the streetcar, and then tweets out, that one time I forgot to pay my streetcar fare, they're checking tickets. Figured it out, great problem solving skills, Pete, hashtag Pete's tweets. Yeah, uh, again, we had the issue today with the Presto. Um, yes, today wasn't so lucky, but no. yesterday, they, I've been having issues with my Presto card. I know people who don't know, Presto is what you use to get on public transit in Toronto. And you can use it on the buses, streetcars, subway. Go train. Go train. And yeah, uh, yesterday ended up, thank God I had uh, three, 325 and change in my pocket and we sorted it out. But so, uh, yeah, Pete's tweets. So Pete's probably, tweets probably, ends. Probably every week. I mean, just before the end of class at 10 o'clock, class starts at 8. Uh, did, did make it to class. So we, we will check in next week uh, with another episode of Pete's tweets coming next week hopefully uh hopefully we're gonna have some more gold because that I, I was dying in class can we awesome. talk about some real stuff please all right <laughs> p wants me to get off Nonsense. his twitter so this is our big topic for the week and we got owen coming in later and he's gonna uh, touch a little bit more on that but we're talking minor league baseball right and um i'm not sure 
if you heard, if anybody's heard about this, but um, the minor league players actually just lost a lawsuit uh, against the MLB to get their wages increased. And this has um, been going on for a while. For like a while. They've had this for lawsuit thrown out multiple times. So uh, for those of you that don't follow uh, minor league baseball, there's a lot of leagues. Um, if I can pull them up here. Okay, so for, for those of you that don't know, underneath the majors, you have AAA, AA, Class A Advanced, Class A, Class A Short Season, Rookie Advanced, and Rookie. A lot of leagues, a lot of players. A lot of teams. A lot of money. Okay. A lot of money. A lot of money. And a lot of these guys are playing for nothing. You know, you look at the average uh, average salary for the first year on a 40-man roster. Uh, I think you pulled this up here. In 2015, the average salary was $41,000. In what level? Okay. Just that's just that's just forty a, man roster. 40 okay, man so roster. that's for, that's for, guys. And so we go here. Guys, so for triple A, all those guys. For AAA. The forty man roster for people that don't know. Forty man roster is the your twenty five guys in the major leagues, and then you have set guys in the minor leagues who you can call up to the major leagues. If you're not on the forty man roster, you can't play in the major leagues. So forty man roster, most of the guys are in triple A, and then there are usually a couple of guys who are. So in here's double. the stat, right? For triple A. Okay, the monthly salary for your first year is two thousand one hundred and fifty dollars per month. You know what that works out to? You know how much money? That, and think and think about the season. You're not playing all year. You're playing every single day, though. You, you are playing every single day, but like per month, you're making two grand for what? April, April to what? August? Five five months of work. Do the math. Yeah, ten seven. That's not even counting when you get taxed. Too. No, it's brutal. Right, it goes up to twenty four hundred for your second year, twenty seven hundred for the third year. Um, it, they can obviously negotiate deals and stuff once once that's over. But you know, I'm looking at this and it's just it's criminal. You know, you got my and, and I mean, listen to this. Until a minor league player is placed on a forty man roster, monthly salaries are one thousand one hundred fifty dollars for the short season teams, thirteen hundred for low A and fifteen hundred for high A, and for players represented. Re- repeating a year at the same level, salary goes up fifty dollars. We sure. also have to take a look here and think about it like this too. You know, as someone who's played with and against a lot of guys who are playing minor league baseball, like Owen and I were teammates for three years. There's a, a couple other guys who we played with who are playing in the minor leagues now. So, like, you know, I like to think that I know what I'm talking about a little yeah, bit yeah, here. Yeah. But these guys aren't playing in, you know, Idaho or. Wisconsin. They're playing in Florida and Arizona for the most. In the middle of the summer. In the middle of the summer, it's 110 grand. In Arizona, and they cannot in. play day games because it's so hot, and they don't want the players to get dehydrated. Right, yeah. and these guys are showing up in Florida. We'll go through a day in, in the life, quote unquote, of a minor league player with Owen. But from what we've talked about before, and just texting and whatever. He's there all day, and he's a catcher too. So he's got to worry about the pitchers. He's got to worry about hitting. He's got to worry about defense, and then he's got to go play a game. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, is what it is. I mean, I, I, that's that's just it. Like you go through, and and we talk about, and we'll get we'll get quickly into our into our next game, and I'm really looking forward to this one. But the the thing that the thing that I hate about all this is. A lot of these guys are doing this and then coming home and having to find other jobs. Exactly. Like Owen's coming from work right now yeah. when he yeah. gets here. I mean, and the guy's been playing ball all summer. Yeah. Right. And the other thing is And, and it's not like – and sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not like you're down there and you're you're making a name, you know, doing like what we're doing, like trying to get through school. Right? You're down there every day, day in and out, playing, playing baseball because that's all you can do. Yeah, exactly. And if you even if you look at these Latin guys, they're coming over for like ten grand when they're sixteen. Like if you look at uh, if you look at Sal Perez's contract, his contract's like thirteen million for five years. Yeah, and that guy catches every single game, and he's an all star. Like that's, and, and then they wonder why. Sorry to cut you off, but you know, there's all these people who are talking about how absurd athletes salaries are and how 
How do these guys get paid? But, but David Price. Some of them are. Look at Clayton Kershaw. What is he making? Thirty-seven million a year. Something okay, like that. but for the guy who isn't Clayton Kershaw, who was a first-round pick and who got a big signing bonus in the millions, for a guy who's a twenty-seventh-round draft pick, playing from his four-year. Look at Kevin Pillar. Kevin Pillar was a Division two outfielder. Got drafted in like the thirtieth round. Probably got around a ten thousand dollars signing bonus, and that guy's making five hundred grand for the first five years, six years of his career. A lot of times, when you look at these guys who get through their rookie contracts, no kidding, they want a ton of money. If you look at a guy like Aaron Sanchez, Aaron Sanchez led the Major League Baseball and ERA for starting pitchers this year. He's getting paid five hundred grand. Yeah, no wonder they want it because you never know when your arm might blow out. Like well, that, no and, and, and your exactly. season, and you know, and your entire career might be over. You're and make in as baseball, much, well, as it, when you can, right? Because you've been struggling for so long. In baseball, it's guaranteed money too. It's not like in the NFL. If you're a running back who tears his ACL, and they could say, "Oh, all right, sorry, on to the next guy." No. So uh, an example I like to use with people is I don't know if you remember a guy named Travis Hafner who used yep. to play for the Indians, yep. Yep. but they gave him like a three-year, sixty million dollar contract in probably like the mid to late two thousands, and the guy played like. I don't know, he hit 50 bombs one year and then they gave him the big contract and he probably played like a few hundred games, if that, yeah. for three, four years, right? So, But he still got his 60 million, right? Yeah, exactly. But again, if you look at these kids coming up, it's like, come on, guys. Think about it. The average annual salary for a Major League Baseball team was around, I think, 20 million we looked at. Yeah. At the, the like, like yeah. bare, the bare minimum. minimum. Bare minimum, sorry. Not the average. The bare minimum. But... If you're looking at teams like the Yankees and the Red Sox, the Toronto Blue Jays even too, the Toronto Blue Jays probably have the richest ownership in baseball. Yeah, and it just it's, it's just been going up like each year. Exactly. And they're putting all this money, they're putting all this money into their major league systems, but these guys in the minors are struggling to get Chipotle for dinner every night. Well, they're struggling just like just like every kid that's putting themselves to university. Exactly, except they're getting paid less. Yeah, exactly. And they're doing way more work. So, I just want to bring up um yeah, this leads us right nicely into our next topic. Uh, and this is a game we're going to play every week. Pete and I agree on a lot. Like, we are very similar people. And so it, it makes for great discussions when we're talking about things that we agree on. But I, I got I got, it, I got it online here. I got one right here. I, you know, Pete's got it in, in the studio here. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip a coin. And whoever loses the coin toss is going to have to argue the other side of the argument. So right now our argument is... Just for argument's sake. Yeah, just why not? So our argument is... Minor league players are underpaid, okay? That is that is what we were arguing. And for the record, we both agree. We both agree, hundred percent. But after this coin flip, whoever loses is going to have to argue the minor league players are not underpaid. We got to argue for the MLB. You want you want to call it? Tails, your cons. Heads, I'm cons. All right. It's heads. heads. So I'm cons. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if I'm Major League Baseball or the teams. And I'm looking at this and you're saying, and you're the PA and you're saying, my guys are underpaid. And you probably, you could probably talk about it to your dad. You've probably talked about this with your dad because he's in the NHL PA. He's one of the higher ups. Or is he, the, is he, he, he was, he was, he was, he was so, not, not since he retired. So if you're looking from the major league baseball perspective, you could say, Hey guys, listen, uh, you're going out there, you're playing baseball and getting paid for it. You know, it's not like you're cutting grass. It's not like you're, you know, working in, uh, at McDonald's, you're getting to come and work with the greatest coaches in the world, and you're here for a reason to try and make it to the bigs. So, from that aspect, you can almost say that you know it's a privilege. And you hear athletes say it all the time: "I'm blessed. I'm privileged to play professional sports," and they are. But at the same time, you know, and in this case, they're grossly underpaid. But if you're Major League Baseball and there's no proper union in place because they striked and then came back and have the same infrastructure since before 1994 when they had the strike, they're saying, hey, listen, guys, you cannot play. Like, it's, it, the players have no, no outs here, right? So if I'm Major League Baseball, I'm saying, hey, guys, listen, you're playing baseball for a living, right? If you don't want to play, if you don't like it, go work at McDonald's. Go back to the Dominican Republic. Go back to Venezuela. Right? What's your, what are your what are your other options? If you don't want to try and be a professional baseball player, okay. There's a hundred other guys in your organization. But here's but here's the thing. Here's the thing. These guys have invested so much time, and you will know. You'll know how much time these guys have invested to get to where they are. 
right? And and you know to pay them so little for that amount of work, you know, if we talk about just straight dollars per hour, it's nothing. It is pennies. It is absolute pennies. And you're gonna okay, uh, uh, okay. All right. But if you're, you know, if you're the Vancouver Canadians, which is a bad example because they draw well. Um, and you're in a single A team who's charging 15 to 20 bucks for tickets, you know, if you're some team in the middle of, uh, in the middle of some BS state, you know, and you're drawing 2000 people a game and you're a double A team, well, it's not like you're raking in dough either, right? Yeah. But I mean, without some of these players, the MLB doesn't have the players they have, right? So how can you argue that the MLB shouldn't fork over some of this cash. Because, I mean, yeah, the MLB has money to blow with the amount of money that they're spending on some of these. Well, how, well, how hard would it be to take X amount of dollars from each organization and give that to their minor league teams? Because they sure as hell don't need it. Are you asking me or am I still defending the other side? You, all right. You've done your part. You've defended the other side. Now now give, now give it to me on the, on, on the good side. Look, and again, Owen's coming in here in like five minutes. Um so we again we can talk to him about it but look at the end of the day these guys go out there they're there from 6 in the morning till god knows when at night perfecting hitting in the cages working out working on the drills defensively working with the coaches and you know if you look at a guy like Chris Bryant Chris Bryant's 23 he was a juco guy you know not many guys can shoot up to the major leagues in you know a day or Bryce Harper. Yeah, Bryce Harper. And be 20 years old, 19 years old, playing in Major League Baseball. It doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Tyler Naquin on the, on well, the Indians. Look at, He's look, 24. Look He's at a Jose, rookie. Jose Bautista made his debut in 2004. His MLB debut was in 2004. A lot of these guys, it's not even until they make it in the majors for a few years that they start to make this impact. How often in baseball especially, we see it a lot now in hockey uh, with you know Matthews and McDavid. Even in football, the guy's going straight from college after a year or two. Well, you know why? In the, N- in the NBA. Oh, NBA especially. Well, they make money. Exactly. Because these guys know that if they're not playing basketball or not playing hockey, they're doing nothing. Okay, but baseball's not basketball. Even soccer. The soccer guys are pros. Or the tennis, soccer, tennis, they're pros when they're 16, 17 they years old. Be. But, you know. It doesn't work like that in baseball. No, it doesn't work like that in baseball. And you can throw 98 miles an hour, but if you have no idea where it's going, then... Well, how many guys are throwing 98 miles an hour nowadays? Like... Everybody. Exactly. It's not, it's not, like, it's not like back in the day where throwing 90 miles an hour was huge. Exactly. And if you're throwing it straight and flat and right there, any professional hitter is going to be able to hit exactly. it. Right? You're there with the best of the best. And... I think yeah, Owen just texted me. He's he's on his way in here now, so we're going to take a quick break in a second. But anybody who doesn't appreciate what these guys do and who can't see why they need more money is ludicrous. Absolutely. So who do you let us know down in the comment section below if you're watching this on YouTube. Let us know what you think about this topic. Uh, if you have an opinion. If you don't have an opinion, let us know anyways. I want to hear it. Uh, and also uh, at Big Pete 44 follow Pete on Twitter, hashtag Pete's Tweets, and uh, at AlecReed14, follow me on Twitter there. Okay, guys, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to have our guest, minor league catcher Owen Spiewak from the Toronto Blue Jays. You're listening to the Big and Tall Sports Podcast. Blue Jays minor leagues, Owen Spiewak. Owen, what's going on, dude? Nothing much. Good to be here. Speak up a little bit. Speak with your chest. You hear me? Yeah. Good, good, good. Chest. yeah good to chest. be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem, buddy. So we were just talking a little bit before we started recording. Uh, obviously, we came back from our break now. We were talking about uh, how much you guys get paid. So 
maybe can you take us through a day in the life, so to speak, of a minor league baseball player, and then we'll get into some numbers for you. Sure, yeah. Uh, day in the life starts early, um, waking up in your hotel room. Hotel, so you, you don't get billeted or anything? They put you up in the hotel? Depends on what level you're at. Um, the lower lower two, three levels, you're in, a, you're in a hotel, and then there's a billet, and then after that, once you get into high, double A, triple A, you're on your own. So a home, an apartment with a couple buddies, whatever it is. Um, but you're up at 5.30, 6, depending on uh, how far you are. Get to the field. Uh, you're going to eat breakfast, go through your workout. You're through 7.30, 8 o'clock now. Um, go out into the cage, get some early work in, hit off a tee, do whatever you need. Maybe there's a coach out there. Um, by 9 o'clock, get out there, stretch, go through your... Team stretch? Team, team stretch, everyone, yeah. Everyone, so everyone's there now. Everybody's there. Um, there'll be a position group and then a pitcher's group led by the trainers. They'll go through all of that. Um, they'll take you out onto the field. You'll do your training, whether it's BP, for me, catching drills, outfield, outfield drills. Um, once that, that's done, that's a couple hours, break in for lunch around 12, eat lunch, and then depending on what level you're at, get ready for your game. So game at 1, 2 o'clock. And then that's for spring training and the lower levels. And then the higher levels, you have night games. So you'll do that same routine, but you'll show up at around 12 instead of 6 a.m. And then your night game's at 7. So, so standard day, like what's your time frame? What's your standard day? Uh, waking up out of bed, 5.30 to 6, getting back to bed at 5 o'clock maybe. It's a 12-hour day. Yeah. At least a 12-hour day. Yeah, at least. Okay. So, no, take, take, take. so, no, so we were t- we've talked about this before just privately because we're buddies. But so when you go in and you play these games, mm-hmm. you know, you're obviously they're playing nine inning games. It's not like, you know, OUA or whatever. You're playing seven inning games. You're playing nine inning games and you're playing in Florida. Yeah. Right, so or Arizona in the case of some of our other friends and other minor league teams. So when you're playing in that heat, I know you ha- you dealt with it a little bit earlier this year. So what is it like going out there every day and playing? And you know we've done it as kids for short amounts of time, but you're doing it every single day for six months. Yeah. So you know you dealt with your um, with dehydration, is that what it was earlier this year? So can you maybe just speak on, you know, how how difficult it is to go out there and perform every day in the conditions that you're you're playing in? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's definitely hot, and it's, like you said, it's every day it's a grind. Um, when they talk about minor league baseball, it's absolutely a grind, and you don't realize that until you're there, and you realize how long the hours are, and it's every day. Um, but like you said, it's hot. I mean, it's 90, 200 degrees every day. If you're in Florida, you have the humidity. And you're a catcher, too. And I'm a catcher, so I'm in full gear all day. There's no breaks. Um, and there's not really any downtime throughout the day. So, like, one, you have to stay hydrated. I did my best. Um, everyone does their best. But even with that, depending on the day, sometimes it's not enough. I mean, I was hydrating enough, and I still ended up going to the hospital. So it's just, it's a grind. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Owen, uh, pull us some. Pull some stats for him real quick. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, Owen, uh, currently playing, played uh, last year with the GCL Blue Jays, Gulf Coast League Blue Jays, uh, batted 293 in 2015, originally drafted 2013 to the Mets, uh, then after batting 387 at Odessa College down in Texas. Uh, both pretty hot places. In case you guys don't know, Florida and Texas in the summer are very hot. Uh, then we drafted 10th round to the Blue Jays on the on June 9th of the day two draft. Is that 2014? 2015? 2015. 2015. Uh, and in 2016 this year, he had 18 defensive assists in 24 games. Called up to the Vancouver Canadians on September 1st and played one game there at the end of the year. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know. So how does uh, you know how does the ball compare? We go from Texas to Florida. And then obviously you get in that one game call up. Uh, how, how does how does all that differ? How much more difficult is it going forward? Um, I mean, college professional baseball is a bit of a gap, bit of a difference. Um, well, you were JUCO, right? So yeah, you, yeah, I was a JUCO player. Um, and obviously there's a difference between JUCO and then D1, D2. But um, being at college uh, is fun. I mean, it's in Texas, like you said, so it's hot. It's not as humid though, so I dealt with the heat a little bit better there. Um, Jump into pro ball. It's a fun experience. Fun to get going. Um, new coaches. Everything's different. You're excited to be there. 
fast forward to this year, um, played pretty well defensively, end up getting called up to Vancouver for the end of the year. Um, and that was a blast just being back in Canada, playing for the only Canadian affiliate that we have other than the major league team. Um, in front of home fans, and they get they get a lot of fans too, right? They they, they, they lead the league. I think there's like six thousand people. A game. Yeah, they they set a record this year for attendance. Uh, they've sold out every game. Six thousand fans, uh, rain or shine. So I mean, they're out there and they're loud. So, when you're going up, um, and you're you know you're GCL obviously the last two years, and then going up to Vancouver, and obviously, so are the roster sizes in the GCL different? Because that's kind of the spring training headquarters. There's always guys rehabbing there. Like, is it is it different? Is it a lot different going from the GCL where there, you know you're at the spring training headquarters? You know, we've talked about this again, where how nuts it is there when the major league guys are down there and all the minor league guys are there for extended. So, what's it like? What was it like? I know you weren't there for a long time, but what was it like going to that transition to a regular quote unquote minor league schedule or like a regular everyday? Uh, baseball schedule that everyone's accustomed to where you show up at 12 and play a night game kind of thing yeah. as opposed to what you've been used to yeah it's it's very very different uh, it's, like you said it's very hectic down in Florida um, there are major league guys that are coming down to rehab there are minor league guys coming down to rehab um, the rosters and who's playing that day fluctuates a lot more because of that so you're going to have different guys coming in and getting spot starts at different positions um, and then your days are so much longer and there's just so much commotion there are different rovers different coaches scouts presentations um and then you get up to a higher level like vancouver and it's a lot more of a relaxed setting um the, there's there's more trust from the coaches instilled in the players to show up get your work in they know what they have to do we're at an old enough age where we can take care of all that it's um, like a it's like a regular you know show up yeah show this up, is, get you're ready. a professional athlete do this your is thing. my job i'm here to i'm here to work and it's it's less of um the coaches the adults watching over you and making sure you get it done now in college you know we've both played uh at different two different levels but a lot of the structure and the way the teams go about their business is relatively similar so we would do you know six hour practices every day and then you know we'd go out and play games on the weekends and we'd have a midweek so our schedules were literally wake up go to weights go to class practice, study hall, do it all over again the next day. So going from that, because I'm assuming at Odessa it was pretty similar. Yeah, pretty similar. Very similar, yeah. So going from that and taking the school aspect out of it and replacing it with more baseball, has it been easier because you're only focusing on one thing now or has it been a little more difficult just because you really have to, your attention is going from 6 o'clock in the morning till pretty much 6 at night? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a little bit tougher. I mean, like you said, now you're focusing on only your sport, so you'd think it'd be easier, but um, because you're so you're so focused in on purely your baseball, um, it's a little bit more mentally draining. And you're going, like you said, from six in the morning to six at night. It's a it's a very long time. You don't have any downtime um, throughout that day. There aren't any breaks to kind of decompress. You're you're you have to be locked in the whole time. Whereas that when you're in college, you go to your class. You have other things on your mind. And you can kind of set different times for everything that you got going on. So, transitioning back into what we were talking about earlier, we've gone through a whole day. We've gone through kind of the different experiences. You know, there are guys coming in here that you're playing with who are coming from the Dominican or Puerto Rico or somewhere from the U.S. maybe even. And they're making like 10 grand as their signing bonus. You know, some guys will be higher. Yeah, you know, you'll have... Depends the, on who it is. And you'll have the um, the bonus babies. Obviously, bonus babies are the really high draft picks yeah. who get millions. Yeah, I mean, this year I had guys that literally signed for nothing. So they just, they got a plane ticket, um, show up. And then there was also players on my team that signed for one and a half million, two million. So it just it depends. So that's from the signing bonus, and then everybody makes the same that's, that's, salary. That's the signing unquote. bonus, and then um, everybody has the same salary, correct? So being in that setting where guys are so young, and it's you no, know, you know, a lot of guys don't have the maturity level sometimes that we see with professional. But is there kind of is it difficult being in that setting sometimes where there are so many different cultures? You know, there's a language barrier with the Latin players and the American and Canadian guys. And also with that monetary where there's guys from all sorts of different walks of life and you guys are 
all here in kind of a clutter playing together in the team, you know, is it is it difficult to get into a team atmosphere just from your past? And, you know, like when we played together, we had an extremely tight group. You know, just going commenting on that from now you have guys from all over the place making all sorts of different types of money. Yeah, I mean, it definitely can be. I think it just it depends on the group of guys you have around you. Um, this year, my team was um, primarily Latin players, a lot of Dominicans, Cubans, um, Colombians, Venezuelans. Um, last year, there were a lot more Americans, so there's a lot more English this year. It was a lot more Spanish, but it just depends on, on the guys around you. It's, I mean, the money matters and whatnot, but if you have a good group of guys, and this year, for the most part, we did have a good group of guys, um, the, team, the teams tend to mesh pretty well, and I noticed that in Vancouver as well. They had a great group of guys there, a good core at least. Um, so there was a good bunch of the team that, that meshed well. So you're a catcher, so you got to deal with all these pitchers who speak different languages. Yeah. If you're going out there and some guys, you know, been wild, walked a couple guys, how the heck do you communicate with them? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it varies. Some of the some of the Latin guys, they speak a little bit English, so there's enough for me to get by. And I also try and pick up little things in Spanish to try and get by. Um, other than that, I'll either have to call in one of the infielders if they happen to speak Spanish for the bilingual, <laughs> have them translate it, or honestly, I'll just have to look at them and give them my version of sign language, point at them, tap them on the chest, give them a bump, whatever it is. If, if I'm angry, I'll, they'll know that I'm angry. If it's I'm trying to calm them down, they'll be able to tell with my facial expressions and less with just language. So you just kind of have to work with it and you just got to deal with, with it. it. It's part of the game. So getting back to so you guys go through all these crazy things and all these days that are super long and crazy weather, but you're making what, like eight bucks an hour when it works out to it? Uh, I don't even know if it works out to that high, to be honest. It's it's something, I mean, monthly. I know what it is monthly. I don't know what it is hour, but it's not. What is it monthly? Monthly, after taxes, after um, all of the, the money to take out for hotel and food, we pocket to, I want to say 230 a month. Jesus so you make um, 230 a month from... And you report just after big league guys do, and March. you you yep, report in March, beginning of March, and you're there till when did you get back? End of August. Uh, beginning of September, end of August, yeah. So that's how many months? Six? Did we six, say six, seven months? Two hundred thirty. That's six months. So you made thirteen hundred dollars this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so <laughs> I'm just, I'll take the mic. Okay. So you say, like, they take out hotel and all that out of it. Like, you don't get... Yeah, so we're paying. So the hotel we stay in, we're paying for out of our, can out of our cho- paycheck. Can you choose to pay for a crappier hotel? Oh, I mean, we're... I mean, you're probably staying... We're not, we're not, in, we're not in the <laughs> Marriott. I mean, no, but that's what I mean. Like, is, there's no option to, like... No, it depends It depends on um, what year you're in. So there's a restriction for first and second year players, I believe. Um, you have to stay in the hotel. And same with spring training, you have to stay in the hotel. Um, and then after that... After the first or second year, you have the ability to live off, and then they'll they'll give you money for food because you won't be provided food at the hotel, which again comes out of our paycheck. Um, but until then, you're you're stuck there. And how many how many games are you playing? Like uh, in the season? Yeah, 60, 60 I think sixty two something so like, like that. 30, 30 of them at home then, right? Yeah. yeah. So for half the season, you're just literally paying for your. Paying to play baseball pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Well, when you guys go on the road, you come back that night. Like, everything's in Florida. You're uh, yeah, when when you're in Florida, the, the team that I started on this year, it is. Um, there'll be 15-minute bus rides, half an hour, hour, two and a half hours. Um, and then when I was up in Vancouver, because the trips are longer, seven hours, 10 hours, 15 hours. And they're still, they're still on the road. busing everywhere, right? Yeah, you still bus everywhere. Yeah. I mean, we took <laughs> – I mean, we're kind of blessed, and I can, you know – plug my our next week's guest in here my uh my head coach but uh Stu Lang like we, I played varsity football like he, he flew us out to like Manitoba for a game and like we had what 100 guys on our team that's ridiculous like we I mean you know we don't it almost seems unfair like that I, I got to play football and got to travel and have a hotel and have meals for free this is like and you're and you're playing pro baseball yeah. and they're making and, and they're not even making those accommodations and you know, that can kind of lead us back to, like, we come full circle with this. You think about how much these guys are making professionally. You think they're paying for their hotel? Not a chance. Not a chance. We've touched on this before with some of our buddies who are at higher levels, and we've talked about this, but 
you know, we've looked at it since we were younger, talking about it and saying it seems like the more, the better you are, the more free stuff you get. That's that's true. The, <laughs> more, the more endorsements you get, the the better the pay is, the higher you go. Equipment, like you don't better, get, like you don't get equipment. the same stuff that a guy who went in the first round gets. No, um, I mean with me, my agent, um, he's a really good guy and he's he's got some connections. So where I am, I'm a little bit um, more blessed than other other players that are at a similar level. But no, there's definitely a comparison, um, or not a comparison rather between the things that I'm going to get and then a first round guy, a guy who got 4 million in the draft. So, you know, when we're talking about getting, you know, even something like getting bats, sure. like the team does pretty much nothing. Like the stuff you have to do, you're pretty much on your own in terms of the equipment that you need to get, the, your food outside of your work hours Correct. and you're staying at the hotel that they set up, but you still have to pay for it. Yes. But as a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's laughable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy's a pro. And that, and that's, I'll, I'll pull the mic closer. And I'm just reminding you guys, this guy is a professional athlete having to pay for his own shit. Just reminding you that. So when you look at, you know, obviously your aspirations are to make it to the bigs one day, whether that be with. You know, uh, hopefully with Toronto. Yeah, but I mean, hopefully with Toronto, but at the end of the day, you want to play Anywhere. somewhere, you know what I mean? So, so if, you're, um, if you're coming up and you're making your way up and the more and more, you know, how does that, have you talked to guys or seen guys where you've seen it affect, you know, how different it is? And even you just going up to Vancouver, but have you seen the differences with guys who have come back down to rehab or in spring training who have you played with last year who maybe went to double A this year or who went another place? Like, how does that experience change? Because you're at the bottom right now and you're paying for, you're probably giving up the most of your money. Whereas a guy in New Hampshire or in Lansing might, you know, have you, what's that experience like as you get higher? Is it, are you still giving up as much of your own money? And what's the pay difference? Like, did you get paid more when you went to Vancouver or was it the same? Um, to be honest, I couldn't tell you if I got paid more or not. I'm not sure. I got the one paycheck there and I don't remember what it was. Um, if it was more, it's, it's nothing. nothing Extravagant. Crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the higher you go, there's, there are other dues too. Like there are clubhouse dues and whatnot. So there, there are people in there that they help take care of you with the equipment that is provided. Like they'll take the balls out to the field. They'll do whatever. They'll do laundry. Um, so then we help out in their clubhouse dues. It'll be say thirty bucks every month. The higher you go, the more the more money you're going to be paying because you're making slightly more money. But the more stuff they do. For the you. more stuff they do, the more accommodations there are, um, the more pampering there is. So we talked about this real quick, and this is this just blows my mind. Uh, we talked about this before before Owen uh, got on the air here, but. We talked about if you get thrown out of a game, yep. how much does that cost you? Uh, if you get ejected from a game, the fine's a thousand dollars, and then the the manager is also fined a thousand dollars. So in essence, the player is paying two thousand dollar fine. And so because the manager's not going to pick that up. So basically, you get thrown out of a game and you lose your entire and your salary. You lose all the money that you worked for that year. Exactly. So um, I'll, I'll kind of I'll kind of parlay that into. Let's get back to the lighter side of this, because I mean we're getting pretty like we're getting, going pretty far down a rabbit hole here with how what we've been talking the about. The point here. is, these guys need to get paid. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not making crazy money, but at the end of the day, I mean, we signed up for it. It's our dream, and it's definitely my dream. So, I mean, we're gonna put the hours, I'm gonna put the time in. Um, and I mean, if you t- talk to any minor league baseball player, they're not really gonna complain. They're gonna pay their dues. And would we like to see things change? And make a little bit more money, of course we would, especially for some of the guys that are older. I mean, I'm 21, but some of the guys that are 25, 26, um, maybe they have kids, maybe they have a wife, whatever it is. It's a lot tougher to raise a family with, with that income. Um, I'm fortunate enough where I'm young enough right now. Um, my parents can kind of help out with things if I need. I'm in a better situation than somebody who's older and, and really needs it. And, you know, you were also in a position where – you know, you were fortunate enough to get a bit of money in your signing bonus, whereas some of these guys, you know, you had a bit of a leverage coming out of your first year of junior college, where some of these four-year guys who we've played with yeah. were who were phenomenal baseball players, but they're coming out and they're getting drafted in the 30-something round, and here's a plane ticket if you want to come play professional baseball, but if not, so what? Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of, 
even like I said, that I played with this year that are in my organization, I played with a lot of guys that are great people, great players, and because of the situation, they, just, they didn't get any money out of the draft because they don't have that leverage to. So let's go back. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go a little lighter now. Um, I mean, it's every kid's dream, right, to on draft day to yeah. see your name called. Obviously a little different in baseball because there's a lot of rounds. Hit twice. 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 Get your name called twice. Obviously a little different in baseball. It's not like there's, you know, the first round you get to see it live and everything like that. But just take me through, like, that day you see your name get called, what's going through your head? Um, the first the first time when I was drafted with the Mets, um, I was actually I was out playing a game um, with my high school team, well, travel ball team. Um, Pete was there. Um, I didn't get the call. My dad got the call. Um, he came over, told the coach, coach came over, told me, um, I mean, I'm obviously I'm excited. Uh, I'm pleased to, to hear that. I mean, like you said, it's every kid's dream. I've been waiting however many years since I thought this is a possibility. I've been working towards it. Um, fast forward two years later, drafted by Toronto. Again, I'm on a baseball field. I'm in the Northwoods league. So I'm in Minnesota playing in a collegiate league after my, my school season finished out on the field. Agent calls me, said, Hey, they're thinking about taking you. Blah, blah blah. This is the number. This is the round. Um, and personally, for me, it wasn't um, it wasn't like the fairy tale that you'd think because if you if you ask anyone, you actually get the story from someone. It's an extremely stressful time. I remember we were talking the day before the draft in our chat with all our OBJ buddies, and we were talking about it, and we were all like, "Oh, and like, who's going to draft you?" And he was going like. Well, it might be this team. It might be this team. But at the end of the day, I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, tomorrow. it's 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 and Toronto. Very stressful. Yeah, and Toronto came uh, came and drafted him. But just going back to you know, because we've seen a few of our buddies get drafted like that, where it's you know you get drafted, but we're in the middle of a game right now, so it's all fun and fun and games. But at the end of the day, especially the first time, because you kind of were on the fence of if you were even going to go or not. And obviously, yeah. you forewent it yeah. to try and go to a bigger school. But um, speaking on that, do you think that coming that one year that you spent at a JUCO, do you think that more guys, you know, obviously you had a ton of success. Do you think that more guys would benefit from going at least even for that one year of JUCO? We see in all the other sports where there's mandatory, you have to go to school. For at least But a year. baseball, there's not. And speaking again, back, going back to the maturity level of some of these guys that they're giving millions of dollars to a signing bonus. Do you think the baseball might want to take a look at maybe going towards that? You have to go at least one year to a junior college or one year to a four year. Cause right now it's, if you go to a four year, you got to stay for three years. Yeah. Correct. So they really limit that option. Yeah. But if you go to Juco, you can go after your first year like you did. So do you think that baseball should go that way? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't see, I don't see a downside to, to implementing a mandatory one year, two year, um, college experience for me personally it helped me a lot it helped me grow one in my game but two just finding the type of player that I am um, I've always been mature at a young age but maturing as a man as a player um, I got in contact with a great coach there he got me in contact with my agent so a lot of things fell into place from me going to school that one year so for me I mean it was it was the perfect fit it may not have been what I expected or what I wanted but at the end of the day, it was it was fantastic for me. So I think there's and definitely even, not a downside to it. And even with the monetary value, maybe not increasing as much as you would have liked from when you were drafted by the Mets to the Jays, you gained all that experience and all that knowledge and all those other intangibles. Yeah, it was definitely worth it. So again, going back to the second part of the question, which is, do you think that with some of these young guys coming up and making the decisions that they make with their money, if they're bonus babies or if they have if they come from rich families or whatnot are there things in place like do they like put you guys through like a crash course or put you in touch with any sort of financial people or whether even social media because we've seen some of our friends who play professional baseball who do some stupid stuff on social media yeah. uh do they give you guys any sort of training or any sort of advice or advisement to what you should be doing with your money what you should be doing like your image wise public relations wise because i know that's a big thing at a lot of big colleges like even at my school we had to go through media training uh so to speak a media seminar uh, and a conduct seminar and whatnot. Do they do that kind of stuff with you guys? Public relations and um, media training, yes. Um, we call it the 
the media lady. She comes, <laughs> she comes yeah, in. Too. I'm sure she'll love hearing yeah, she, that. Oh, we, she, we, we all had one. We had one when I was a yeah. golf. We had a media lady. I mean, that's, that's, what, media that's what she refers um, to herself as as well. But um, she comes in. She talks about uh, the do's and don'ts of, of using social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is. Um, outside of that, there is absolutely no um, information on the financial side of it. And I don't know if I was talking to you about it. Um, not today, obviously, but um, earlier, my buddy's down in Florida. Um, but I brought that up and I said, I don't know why they don't have someone there, whether it's an accountant, whether it's a financial advisor, somebody working with each organization, with each team, whether they're a rover, whether it's one per spot, per team, location. Um, but there are a lot of guys that that signed for, let's say, 50000 200000 500000 a million, two million. And a lot of these guys don't know what to do with their money. And they start spending it. They buy cars. A lot of the Spanish guys, they go home and they buy houses for their family, which is all, that's all great. I mean, it's your money. Spend it how you want to. But a lot of them end up running out of a lot of money when they could be saving and increasing their value if they had the right information, if they knew where to invest it, if they knew how to put it here and there. And and at, at the very least, just be told the risks of spending it and, and doing things on your own. So they don't have someone there to do that. You know, we obviously hear the horror stories that come from NBA players and NFL players predominantly just because that's where, you know, our demographic, our 18 to 22 college male athlete demographic, those are the guys that are going in. In the NBA, they're getting $10 million. In the NFL, they're getting $30 million, $22 million, right? You guys, even though... You know, somebody gets, you know, good for them. They get a $500,000 signing bonus. Well, you know, you get taxed on half of it. So there goes half of it right there. You got to pay your agent. You got to get your way there to wherever you're going. And then you're not really making any money during the season. So if you're playing in the minor leagues for five, you know, if you're 18, you get drafted out of high school. The chances, unless you're Bryce Harper, you're not making it to the bigs until you're at least 21, 22. Yeah, I, I want to say that the average time is, I think it's five years. It's five or six years. So if you're 18 and you're making it to the bigs when you're 23 and your signing bonus is 50 grand and you're going out and buying a car for even, like if you're buying a used car for like $10,000, yeah. like it's ridiculous. It's, it's, that's the thing. it's probably like the first money you've seen though. It is. Right? And that's, like, that's why I'm saying, I mean, for the American guys, Canadian guys, but especially for the Latin players who are coming out of the majority of the Latin players for the most part are coming out of um, uh, poor areas. Um, I've seen a lot of their homes. I've talked to them. Um, I've been in the Dominican a couple of times and they're just, they're coming out of places where they don't have the money. They don't have the luxuries of, of going to a store and buying the brand new pair of shoes, buying a watch, buying this and that. So they see this money and they go, all right, like, let's go. This is the first time they've ever seen money. They're in America. Now they have all these opportunities and they just, they go crazy. So, from the money and maturity standpoint, again, you think that they should have some sort Absolutely. of, yeah. some sort of some, advisor or somebody who they can advisor. talk to. Just somebody there to bounce ideas off of, just get some info, help help steer them in the right direction, whether they want to follow it or not, but just, just to have it there in place. Yeah, for sure. So what's basically now we're in the off season for you. So you're going back down to Florida in March for spring training and then extended and hopefully... Vancouver or Lansing or Dunedin, one of the A's. Yep. What's kind of your off-season plan now? Like, what do you do? Uh, I mean, I'm training. I train. They they help set it up before we leave. They give us a booklet with um, a training schedule that they'd like us to follow um, four or five days a week, whether it's weights, whether it's pliers, whether it's stretching, conditioning. They've got all that in there. There's some food um, info in there, nutrition stuff, dietary stuff. Um but personally, right now I'm training. I'm training five days a week. Get that in, knock it out, and then in a couple of months around the new year, I'll start really getting into the baseball specific. So my hitting, my catching, throwing, all of the actual baseball specific drills. And you're working now, correct? And I'm currently working, yes. Because you don't make any money. Because we don't make those any money. Guys don't pay. You. Yeah, there are there are a lot of guys. The majority of uh, minor league baseball players. Unless, like we said, they're bonus babies and they got a ton of money, they work in the off season. They'll work one, two, three jobs sometimes. Try and save up some cash, so they'll have something when the season comes and they need to to make some money because they're not living at home. So obviously, another baseball specific question. Going back to the fact that you're a catcher and 
you know, you have to basically focus on everybody's shit yes. all the time. Yeah, I mean, I'm in charge of everything. I'm the eyes. And you have to deal with catching bullpens and dealing with the pitchers, and then you have to worry about defense and making sure that you're on the same page with all the infielders. And then, oh, yeah, you got to remember to work on hitting a 90 amount of fastball. Yeah. So is now in the off season when you don't really have to work with those pitchers as much, is now when you get a lot of your kind of hitting, because I know we've hit together and we've worked out together the last couple of years in the off season, but is now really the time where you can just go in and refine kind of your stuff at the plate? Because during the season, you don't really get a lot of chances to work on your own thing when you have to catch bullpens and worry about scouting reports and other whatnot. Yeah, the off season is when you really tinker and fine tune um, as well as make big adjustments to, to your offense. Not only um, because I'm a catcher, but just any position in general, it's really, really tough to make adjustments and, and change big parts of your mechanics, of your swing, of your approach during the games, during the season. So the off season is when you really get to, to put the work in there and adjust. All right, so we're going we're gonna to have to wrap it up pretty soon. Uh, keep looking at the clock and seeing that Pete and I talked for way too long. Uh, but, you know, quick question. If you could pick... You know, one pitcher, one one game that you've faced uh, that you just felt like you couldn't hit anybody. Who that, is the that I couldn't hit? That you couldn't hit that the toughest pitcher you faced, or that you can remember. Uh, then, we'll go, then we'll go to the easiest after that. <laughs> in, in 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 professional <laughs> any, baseball, any or baseball, anytime. you can call you can call Pete out if you want. No, uh, <laughs> the toughest the toughest and best pitcher I faced um, was in two thousand and thirteen. Mm. A Japanese pitcher, um, Otani is his last name, and um, him and I forgot his other friend's name, but one of his best friends on the team. I talked to them both after the tournament. Anyways, 2013 World Championships in Korea, um, left-handed, 6'6", 98 mile an hour fastball, <laughs> slider, curveball, changeup, four or five pitches. Um, they were all filthy. He went on to play in the Japanese league, and he led the league. He won like their version of the Cy Young. He led the league in ERA, strikeouts, whip, lowest wall, everything. Just at 18. It's ridiculous. So, again, I guess we forgot to mention, Owen also played on the junior national team from 16 to 18 oh, three yeah. years, three years, four years. Yeah. So, through that, you know, you've obviously played against – we were just talking right before about some of the guys that we used to play with and against and that you played against with the JNT. Um you know, are there any other guys you could think of that might be close to the bigs, playing in the bigs right now? You know, obviously, Tyler O'Neill, you played with him. He's in double-A with Seattle. Josh, who we both played OBJ with, um, he was obviously a first-round pick last year. Any other guys that I'm missing? Those those two. I think the quickest to get up there will be O'Neill. I think he'll be up there probably. probably. He had like 30 bombs. In yeah, I think, he'll be, I think he'll get a chance next year. He'll, he'll get a cup of coffee. Um, Naylor is probably next in line behind him. Um, although he's younger and he's lower, but he'll progress quickly. Um, Cal Quantrill with the Padres, um, picked this year eighth overall. Um, I think he's got a good show. His dad pitched for ten years in the big leagues. So, so you're saying like you know we talk about all these guys. These are all buddies of yours, right? Is there? Uh, do you think there's like a change in the guard as far as uh, you know Canadians playing baseball? Because I mean, you look at over the past ten years, you can probably count the number of successful Canadian baseball players on two hands right two, fingers. 10 fingers yeah so, is there, so is, there, is, there, is there a change like is there a change in the mindset and maybe this is we can call them uh you know like carlos delgado babies or something like that but uh <laughs> um i think i think it's a, a variation of a couple different factors um one i mean the game's growing obviously there's better exposure the canadian national team there are better travel ball teams um so we're also getting better training better coaching there's better facilities to work out of and then on the flip side of that with the exposure that we're getting we're drawing more eyes onto us. So each year, let's say there are five, six great players. They go high in the draft. The next year, all the scouts go, hey, there were six guys last year. Let's go out and look again this year. So now there are more eyes on newer kids. So each year, progressively, there are more eyes on you. Thus, we're getting more more players that and, are being taken. And just continuing on that, you know, how many guys have we seen, like we were just talking about, how many guys do we know personally that we played with even just in our organization, that have been drafted over the last three, four years, maybe twenty guys, almost 20, 20, I, I 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 25 guys, 20, 30 guys. So 
you know, and even though another thing is too, like Owen's been drafted twice where baseball is unique in the sense that you can get drafted and then you have that option if you want to go to school or if you want to go where, you know, a lot of people are now bringing up the fact that Chris Bryant was a Toronto Blue Jays draft pick out of high school mm-hmm. and he went back to, to junior college and came out and went second overall or whatever he went. So, I mean, there's a lot of these Canadian guys who might not be playing professionally, but we have buddies who are at. University of Iowa, Kentucky. Uh, we had guys at Florida Gulf Coast. So we're playing It's a pretty big Florida. Mississippi State, Mississippi Virginia. State. I mean, any any school you want to name, yeah. So, we, so have- we have guys all over the place. And that's just the guys from Ontario. That's not counting the really good guys from BC because I know there's a bunch of them coming this year just from working with the Jays and working at Tournament 12. There was like three or four guys who were going to big schools. Cal Berkeley, one guy was going to, I think. Uh, there's a guy going to uh, – another guy going to Mississippi State, Uh Josh's brother just commit to uh, Texas, Texas, Texas A&M, I believe. Texas yeah, I mean, baseball, is, it's, it's booming right now, Canadian baseball. Cooper, baseball. Vanderbilt. Yeah. Like, there's guys coming. There are guys coming, coming up, yeah. Like I said, for they, they, work, they work real hard. There are better facilities, and then there's just more eyes on us. La- really, really last question here because we got to wrap it up. But being a Canadian guy and playing for the Blue Jays, even though it's in the minors, hopefully one day in the bigs, you know, how does that compare in – do you get? Do you find that there's a bit of more of a connection to the name on the front of the uniform just Absolutely. because of your roots? Absolutely. Just because of your roots. Yeah. Um. I mean, I'm repping Canada wherever I go. Um. Whether I'm I'm playing baseball or I'm not. Um. But definitely. And then I really noticed it when I got to Vancouver. I was the only Canadian on that team. Um. The fans. They didn't know me. I just showed up. First game. Walk out onto the field. There's a little league team there. I talked to them for a few minutes. They call my name. We run out um, when they announce the team, and all six thousand fans gave me a standing ovation. I got the biggest, the biggest um, cheer from the crowd that they've had all season, and I've been there for five minutes. Just being a Canadian, connecting with them. Awesome. So I, I think it's That's it's awesome. amazing. Yeah. All right, uh, I think we'll wrap it up on that. Uh, Owen, thanks for joining us. I uh, hope you guys have all enjoyed the Big and Tall podcast. I'm Alec Reed for Pete Apostolopoulos. Get my cousin Liam Parker to play his new track for us and we'll play a set. Thanks for joining us.